but here we go. We are hearing from people who live in Lebanon today after police found a body inside a burning car. Marina Silva is live with what we know about the investigation so far. Marina? Bully, there's still crime scene tape up behind me here where police found a body in a burning car yesterday morning. I spoke with people who live around here who say it's a quiet area. A quiet neighborhood in Lebanon. For Helen Cochran, this is where she called home for most of her life. 56 years. She says it's a close-knit area. Mostly elderly people. Uh, in fact, I guess all of the people uh, are pretty much, well, in one house, is, they're probably in their 50s, 60s maybe. But mo now we're 80, in our 80s, 88. <laughs> Quiet, until yesterday morning when police found a man in a burning car right here at what was the Mary's Budget Inn. Cochran wasn't surprised about the location though. I just kind of read it this morning in passing. I mean, I wasn't too shocked or too surprised the way, you know, how it's been over there. There's been a lot of things happened there, I think, in the past. Questions still remain. Is the victim a local or just passing through? Was he actually staying at the inn? The Lebanon Police Department is handling the investigation along with the state fire marshal. An autopsy was done on Monday. Right now, police haven't released the victim's identification. Cochran says the inn has been a problem before. It's just right now it looks so run down. Just think it affects our neighborhood. It would be so nice to have it gone. <laughs> Annie, whoop. Okay, yeah, I'm here. Um, the inn that they're talking about, it, it's been closed for, for quite some time. And, uh, and it just was interesting and then the the story behind it is even more interesting let's see now can i make that big enough for you guys uh well i guess you could kind of see that um, anyway, police and fire crews in Lebanon responded to a car fire just before 2.30 a.m. on March 19th. Um, it was a Chrysler, New Yorker. Anyway, the Chrysler had pulled into the parking lot behind the abandoned Mary's Budget Inn around 1.30 a.m. Uh, initially, the police had little to go on. The fire, which police said appeared to have been started in the back seat, burned much of what could have been helpful in identifying the person inside. And other things that I learned from, uh, you know, investigating this was that um, the person was located in the front seat of the car and uh, had female clothing. There was female clothing in the car. There was a blonde wig on the seat next to the person. And um, there was a firearm also and a spent round in the vehicle and uh and so at first they they did not know it wasn't until autopsy because autopsies can um you know, even if it's just a skeleton they can tell whether someone is male or female due to um the shape of the pelvis anyway lebanon detective sergeant casey springer said early on they didn't know who was who the vehicle belonged to because the VIN numbers had all been removed from the vehicle. Um, but then when they were going through everything that was in the car, they found a charred piece of paper with the words property of Christine Bechard and lots of women's clothing in the car. So then they were thinking they were looking for a woman. They didn't know yet that this was, was um, that the skeleton was male. And... Oops, I just moved that weird. And um, it was just another document that was burned. Um, and they couldn't identify what the document was, but they had the, a name. They had something to go by. So they ran the name and uh, found out that Christine Bechard lived in uh, Camdenton. And that she had a Chrysler New Yorker registered to her and it's a i think it was a 78 or 
anyway, classic car and took real good, uh, 1979, and took a real good care of it. So anyway, the VIN numbers have been removed, and then they located Christine Bichard, who owned the 1979 Chrysler New Yorker and lived in Camdenton. They went to Camdenton, and when the deputies went to the home, they found out that she and her late husband, Robert, uh, who, according to his obituary, had died in 2012, had lived there for many years. And they also found out that Christine had sold the residence on the, fr on the Wednesday prior, it was the 15th, when uh, she sold the, the ho home to another Camdenton local. And she left a bu bunch of items behind. Um, then they're saying that she was kind of a hoarder. Um, and she only took the essentials with her when she left. And she told the people that she sold the house to that it was just time for her to move on. And that she was planning on moving back to Kansas City to see her boys. And uh, according to Bob's 2012 obituary he and christine were married on october 18th 1993 in miami oklahoma which by the way has some really good casinos uh, yay uh, anyway um there's the obituary or well part of it i'm not i didn't um clip the the entire thing because it goes into other people um and i don't want to like what is it? A dox or whatever. Anyway, Robert Leonard Betchard, son of John F. and Justine Betchard, was born June 3rd, 1924 in North Adams, Massachusetts. He departed this life Wednesday, February 8th, 2012 at 8, 12 p.m. in Lake Regional Hospital, Osage Beach. And he was 87 years, eight months and five days old. And then it goes on to say on October 18th, 1993, in Miami, Oklahoma, he was united in marriage to Christine Joyce Barrett. Together they shared the past 18 years of marriage. He was preceded in death by his parents and a son, Jack. Okay, so, you know, at this point still, they didn't know that the person in the vehicle was male. And then... um. They talked to neighbors, and they and the neighbors said that Christine was the kind of neighbor, uh, you know, she was the kind neighbor on Lake Road in Camdenton. She would share fruit and vegetables from her garden, and over the years, she'd give snacks to some of the kids who lived near her, and she'd wave and smile as she was working in her yard, and um, she never shared much about her life, a few details of where she'd been before she moved there in the early 1990s with her husband Robert and um, many just called him Bob and some called him Big Bad Bob and stuff like that. Anyway, neighbors knew Christine was transgender and many years younger than Bob and I think it was like 20 years younger and anyway, but they didn't know much more than that. A couple didn't talk about themselves and um, you know, then, then uh, Kyle Arnold who's 39 years old and was one of the neighbors. He's, he was the kid of somebody that lived next door to Bob and Christine. Anyway, he says, we just figured they kept to themselves because of the lifestyle. Um, that wasn't common in the early 90s, especially in the Ozarks. You just didn't see that. But we didn't care. She was just Christine who lived next door. And that's one of the things that I really love about Missouri and the people there is that um, they're kind and friendly and you know with the exception of james phelps and timothy norton and you know we won't get into that but anyway you know a lot of people will just you know they're friendly but they also mind their own business at the same time anyway we never asked questions in a long lake road christine would be seen over the years wearing a blonde wig you know just like the blonde wig found in the car often a scarf around her neck and nice outfits to go get groceries most of the time she and bob would be at home together. She lived as a female. She lived a very private life and all of the neighbors knew her as her. And 
when the cops went at the house, they saw an envelope written in pen um, on the Manila envelope. That's easy for me to say, isn't it? Um, anyway, it says, letters I wrote and will never send. And um, there were also belongings from Christine's life, including her days in Kansas City. There were trophies that her boys had won. And... Um, they did talk to other witnesses in the neighborhood who all said that Christine talked about her children. She said how many there were, um, their names, and um, just said that she hadn't had contact with them. And um, the detective also talked to Robert Betcher's children from his previous marriage. And they said that their dad kind of kept Christine pretty protected and that they hadn't seen Christine since the funeral in 2012. And after more investigation, they learned that Christine previously went by Christine Wynn. And after talking with, you know, they, they went and chased down Christine Wynn, and Missouri records and all that. And they realized that Christine Wynn had died in 2018 in Arizona. So, doo -doo -doo, plot thickens. Um, and so they reached out and they were contacting um, family members of Christine Wynn. And then Wynn's granddaughter called the police back. And at one point in the conversation, um, the detective asked if uh, this woman's grandmother had any friends who cross-dressed or were transgender. And that's when they learned about Stephen Wynn, uh, the grandfather who went missing 30 plus years ago and used to cross-dress. Stephen Wynn essentially left Kansas City in 1991. And through the course of the investigation, it was revealed that in 1991, Stephen Wynn resided with his wife, Christine Wynn, same spelling and everything as this Christine Bechard, and their children in Kansas City, Missouri, when he went missing. Over the next 32 years, his family did not have any contact with him, and he was later declared deceased. And I did find um, the probate and stuff for that. It was in 2020 that Christine Wynn in Arizona uh, filed to to declare her husband Stephen deceased, and um, so that was in 2020. Quite some, you know, quite some time after his uh, or not 2020, 2000. You know, it was before she died, but anyway, <laughs> had him declared deceased, and then um, the Wins had seven boys. The first they had was when they were just teenagers. And um, when he disappeared, Stephen told family members that he was leaving. He told his sister that he was leaving. And he had mentioned to his oldest son that he had plans to leave. And he told one of his other sons that he was going out for cigarettes and he'd be back later. And he never came back. And that's funny. Why do they always say cigarettes? Well, you know, some people say that they went out for milk and whatever. But anyway, the excuses when, when they <laughs> disappear. Anyway, the Bichards, Bob and, and Christine, were in a relationship within six months of the time that Stephen Wynn left Kansas City. Um, then the detective says, if not before that, but I haven't been able to confirm that. And because Christine had left so many items in her Camdenton home, the new owners allowed her family to go through and select anything that they wanted to. And inside the home, that manila envelope that was found with two letters inside of it, it the chart had written one was addressed to her mother and the second was addressed to one of her boys and on the outside of the envelope written in pen it said letters i wrote and will never send and the contents of the letter to her son uh she explained to him um her reasons for leaving and and all that um but i don't know the contents of that because that's private for the family we just know that the detective has seen it and said that the the family has that letter now um and anyway also inside the home were belongings from christine's life including some of her days in kansas city including the trophies that her boys had won and and oh i repeat i'm repeating myself here though but um the new owners allowed her family to go through and select anything that they wanted to out of her stuff and um 
the detectives say that uh, nothing appears suspicious in this case. You know, they, they found uh, her plans for um, what she ended up doing. And um, in the car, they located the, the handgun, um, the magazine, and a spent casing. So they believe that uh, her death was um, self-inflicted and that she uh, was, you know, she planned this whole thing out. And then, you know, I'm just going to leave this up here for you guys. 988 is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. It provides 24-7 free and confidential support. Trans Lifeline is a crisis support hotline created by and for trans people. And you can contact that hotline at 877-565-8860. And uh, let me get back over to my stream yard. Yes. Um, so anyway, um, that was an interesting story and since this is um pride month and everything i decided to go with that one uh, 